He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. When I used to teach at the Ringling College of Art and Design, one of the things I used to do was to try and give my students examples of what constitutes motion design. It's kind of a tough thing to put your finger on, so I would always show a really wide variety of work. And one of the examples that I really like to show was the opening credits of the film, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Produced at the legendary Blur Studio, these credits are insane. You've got some incredible CG imagery, an amazing soundtrack from Trent Reznor, beautiful title design, some really crazy fluid simulation. It's kind of got it all. And one of the masterminds behind this title sequence is a man by the name of Owner Senturk. This Turkish-born director designer is kind of a unicorn in our industry. He designs, he animates, he understands the most technical parts of using 3D software, and he's also an incredible visionary director. In this interview, I dig into this man's brain and try to figure out how Owner comes up with the incredible visuals that he's known for and how he juggles the conceptual and creative side of this field with the really technical side and what it's like to be a director working on high profile pieces for clients all over the world. If you're curious what it's like to direct in this industry, I think you will get a ton out of this episode. So let's dig in. Well, Owner, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This is uh, really, really exciting for me, and I'm so pumped to have you. Hi, Joey. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited as well. Excellent. All right. So, um, you know, I think our students and, and people listening to this, they might be familiar with your work because you've worked on some really high end, high profile things. Yeah. Um, but there's not a lot of information about you personally on the Internet. There's some artists and directors that are like all over Twitter and you can find out their whole life story really easily. Yeah. Um, but you're not like that. So I was wondering um, if you could give us a little background. I, I saw on your LinkedIn page when I was mm-hmm. stalking you that you studied fine art and illustration, but ended up getting an animation degree. So I'm curious if you could talk about your, uh, like the early days, the educational background. Sure. Uh, In in my early days, uh, let's say I'll just start more early than that education as well. So in my countries, I I always watch watch the the scary movies that is done in 80s or like a B class or C class. Uh, scary movies and I'm, I'm always like obsessed with the title sequences of those so uh, after that I went to study on high school and uh, there's an art program in Turkey so it's more specializing on the visual form mm-hmm. so when you enter it you do like a fi- figure studies you do oil painting uh, like watercolors sculpting uh, traditional photography uh, like a printmaking stuff like that. So I studied that four years, uh, and afterwards, uh, the day when day passes, uh, I'm I'm more obsessed in animation and visual effects, and I wanted to learn what is the big mystery behind it. So I wanted to study animation, and entered the college. Very cool. So when you graduated, yeah, did you work in Turkey for a while, or did you immediately move to Los Angeles? No, that's not very true at all. So uh, I totally worked in Turkey and, and there's not so much a design scene here. There is, it's morely focused on the advertising aspect. And we can say that advertising is not the ideal place to start on if you want to do creative things. So I first started uh, doing stuff in Turkey and I got really depressed after a while. <laughs> Which, is, which comes usual if you're working yeah. in the advertising industry. Uh, then I wanted to do some experimental short films. And when I did my first short film, Nocta, in 2010, I guess, or 2009, uh, it just uh, just become very popular in Vimeo. And so it just uh, bring me international attention, which was very cool. So afterwards, things started happening. 
Interesting. Okay. So I was actually, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you was what is the creative industry like in Turkey? I mean, obviously in the United States, there's a whole bunch of variety and you can, you know, you can make a very good living servicing advertising agencies. I mean, that's actually that advertising agencies were clients that I worked with the most when I was still doing, um, client work. I'm curious what, what about the advertising side made you depressed and kind of drove you away from it? Well, uh, in in the advertising uh, industry, first time when I was starting, I started with the post-production. So I was doing like a roto and cleanup work, which Mm. is like a digital cleaning job. Yeah. Like a digital cleaning in in equal, I can say, (laughs) which was really depressing. So after a while, I did some animation stuff and... As I said, uh, things are not really structured in the U.S. like uh, in Turkey, like U.S. So in U.S. you can do really fine when you're working with advertising or post-production. Because you can make a living and you'll be fine with that. But uh, in here, it's not like that. So since there's no structure, you just can get easily lost in the uh, system. So that's what happened to me. Uh, okay, so it was... So the reason that you moved to the U.S., it was also financial. You weren't able to find work or find clients that would pay you what your time was worth? Uh, yes, we can say that. And I also want to, to prove myself as an international talent because uh, let's say if I'm only working locally in my country and nobody else just knows my work, that means I'm not successful. So there's a like a not written rule. <laughs> In Turkey, that happens like that. So I wanted to prove my talent in the world, and I wanted to go outside and become an international name. Perfect. Okay. Well, you did. (laughs) So congratulations. Um, So I I can imagine, um, you know, I've met a lot of artists that have moved to the U.S. from different countries. Um, and I, I, am very naive about this. I've lived in the United States my whole life. Um, I've traveled a little bit, but I, you know, I, I've traveled to really easy places. I call it, you know, I've traveled to London, I've traveled to Paris, places like that. Mm-hmm. I would imagine coming from Turkey to the U S would be a little bit more of a challenge. There's a, you know, a little bit more of, of a cultural difference, the language barrier, obviously. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. What what was that transition like for you? Did you speak English when you came? How hard was it to, to make the move? Yeah, it was quite easy, actually, because uh, I was always studying in English format. So from my early childhood, I was always watching like the movies and reading novels in English. So it wasn't that much difficult to say. And also in in U.S., it's... Uh, it's a nation of immigrants, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, because, uh, I mean, the core of the United States is also always immigrants, too. So it's not the most difficult place to be in, in the first place. Because when you go somewhere in more established, let's say, in London, there's like, there, there might be a like lot more racism and a lot more stuff can happen there. Or maybe somewhere, uh, another place in Europe. Uh, you can just experience much more racism and stuff like that. But uh, fortunately, I'm not looking that much at Turkish. So people always mistaken me to French, Italian, or Russian. So I was totally fine in U.S. about that too. Gotcha. Oh, and you moved? Did you move directly to Los Angeles, or did you yeah. go somewhere else first? Yes. At first, I went to Los Angeles because I was really curious about the place, and I wanted to see what is Hollywood like. So. It is not quite what you imagine. Okay. Well, Los Angeles is probably great because there are so many cultures there and there's so many yeah. people, um, as opposed to if you moved to the Midwest <laughs> somewhere, yeah. you know, somewhere in Kansas or something. That's totally right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, cool. So when you moved here, did you have work lined up or did you just move here and cross your fingers and hope you'd find work? No, that's not happens uh, when you are coming from another country to United States. <laughs> it's, it's not happening at all. Not, not a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, before coming to US, I was talking with Kyle Cooper, which is a like a very important person in my life. I'm familiar uh, with Kyle Cooper. Yeah, <laughs> he's a uh, he's a name. Work, and I was always imagining to one day to go and meet this with this, meet meet with the guy and see his studio. So it was a good chance to meet with him with email and we just signed a contract and I went there 
in Los Angeles, and I, I moved to Venice. So I enjoyed there like more than a year, hopefully. Yeah, more than a year. Okay, so were you working for Prolog? Where, where were you freelance? Uh, I was working for Prolog during that time. So I started there as a designer and animator. So okay. I did many things. So was, here's something I wanted to ask you about. And, um, you know, to be honest, when, when we booked you on the podcast, um, I, I wasn't even entirely sure what your role was on a lot of your projects because you, you, a lot of your work, I guess the way I would describe it is it's very, very technical looking. There's, it, it's very effectsy and there's particles and there's these crazy simulations and liquid and these really organic 3D forms and beautiful lighting and modeling and everything. Um, is that your skill set? Is that what you brought to Prolog, uh, a technical skill set, or were you sort of more involved in the design end over there? Well, I think it's it will be the both. Uh, I yep. can say because uh, I'm more, I was more focused on the FX side than the animation side because I wasn't knowing. I I was always familiar with the technical side uh, when I just started, and I just grew my design skills later on in the studio. Because, uh, as I said, it's it's much just my dream to be working in Los Angeles and just working with Kyle Cooper. So, it was a good experience overall. And I yeah. I worked on I guess like five or six feature films there, uh, like uh, very very different stuff from one another. And it just mm, grew me it grew me as a person as well. Because in each project I learned something new that I didn't know and I'm not familiar with. Well, I'm sure you learned a, a lot about design yeah. and storytelling there. So I want to get back to the to the technical stuff. Um, so how did you learn to do all of this? Because, I mean, from your educational background, you know, uh, you, you started kind of in a fine art sense and then you went into this animation program. But a lot of the things that I see in your work you know, these are things that people specialize in. Like you can be a fluid simulation specialist. You can be a, you know, a Houdini particle system specialist. Uh, and, and there's not that many people out there that do it. And the ones that do it tend to not end up being directors in the end. Um, yeah. So I'm just curious, how did you develop these skills? Because they're, they're clearly, they're at a very high level and they're in very difficult kind of, um, you know, parts of the process. Yeah, yeah, it's a very technical and uh, difficult process. I, I know that. And um, but uh, you know what I wanted to achieve in the end is to create uh, the things I imagine and translate it to the screen the perfect way possible. So since there was no solution, I said I can create my own solution, and I just created my solution and learned these stuff. And I st I'm still doing the same thing when there's a new project comes in and. Just something new is necessary, I go and learn that. Either it is live action, CG, or uh, any specific technique. So it's good to st step out of your comfort zone and learn new stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Were you always technically inclined when you were a kid? Were you into math and science and things that are a little more... Not at all. Um, so not can, really, okay. You can imagine Turkey, there's not much science going on, so... <laughs> I, I got big dreams so my dream was always just oriented in translating what I imagined to the screen that's all I wanted to do so I, I wasn't after like a money or just a fame or whatever it is I just want to do what I want to create and just see it on the screen and it is just the biggest power I guess and it just makes me very very happy and proud and hopefully people who watches it can just enjoy it yeah, I mean, it's a, it's amazing stuff. And we're going to link to a bunch of your work in the show notes for this episode and, and obviously to your site and everyone can go lo look at what you've done and learn more about you. So did you learn a lot of these skills um, just by, you know, downloading the software and met, and just playing around and staying up late and figuring out how to yeah, do yeah. it? Uh, or does this stuff kind of come intuitively to you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you got to break some stuff to learn some stuff, you know. Just go ahead and just learn it. You know, I got to tell you, it, th this is an answer. This comes up a lot when I when I talk to artists like you. Um, and I always try to dig to see if there's like a secret that you know that the rest of us no, don't. And no no, there never is. <laughs> yeah, there's just a very simple, you know, you know, like a thing. Just a feeling comes. Yeah. Just close your eyes and just go with it. <laughs> 
I love that. I love that. All right. Uh, all right. So let's talk about the early days at, at, at Prologue. So, I mean, you graduated, I think, in 2008. Is that when you got your degree? Yes. Okay. And it looked like by 2010, 2011, you were already working on major film title sequences. Yeah. So what was it like, uh, you know, on your first few projects there? What was the learning curve like to go from working on your own stuff in school mm -hmm. to now working on jobs that are very expensive uh, and have a very high bar? Well, it didn't change much, uh, to, to be honest, because when I was doing something for myself, I was just aiming for a specific quality that I wanted to catch. So, and this, this was just per perfectly aligning with the stuff I do deliver at, that, at those years as well. So it wasn't that much difficult. So I, want, I, I always aim for the highest quality possible. Either I'm doing that job alone or small team or just a big team, it doesn't matter. So I just aim for the highest quality possible and just do whatever I can to make it best way possible. Was there any difference working on a bigger team? Because I'm imagining that, you know, on some of the, the title sequences you worked on, uh, you know, there must have been multiple, multiple artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Social, it is very different. So there's a big social difference in there. And when you are working with a small team, it just becomes very small, but very, very personalized as well so but in a big team that's that becomes another thing it's just uh, becomes a huge party to to deal with yeah and i want to get into that in a little bit when we get into yeah. some of your later stuff so all right so you basically had the best education you possibly could have by working at prologue and with kyle yeah. uh but then you ended up and and i think the way that um i first heard about you was your involvement on the girl with the dragon tattoo titles yeah which are to this day one of my favorite motion design pieces. I think they're brilliant. I love the song that plays underneath. Um, yeah. So can you just uh, tell us how did you end up working with Blur um, and what was your role on that project? Yeah, it's very complicated <laughs> to answer these <laughs> questions. Is Take all the time you need. Uh, you know, before doing that, I was doing this, some, some stuff at Prolog, but uh, I guess some people at Blur just saw my short films, which are in line with the Girl Dragon Tattoo and that the mood comes with it. It's just a very like a edgy and a very black stuff. Just screams at your face type of stuff. Mm -hmm. so I guess that's happened like that. And I, I stepped in the process and do many things for the title. So I can tell them all these detail if you want. Yeah, I'd be curious to know because, uh, you know, I'm imagining that that had to be a pretty big team. There's modeling and lighting and animation and simulation. And I, I read a little bit on the art of the title. There were actually yes. a third party companies doing some of the simulation because it was so heavy. So I, I've never worked on a project of that scale. So I'd love to hear how it works and, and specifically what your role was, um, because mm -hmm. You know, you have David Fincher, who's the director of the movie, yeah. and then you have Tim Miller, who's, you know, a, the director at Blur. But then you're, you know, at what point did they bring you in? Yeah, I, I just started in the beginning, to be honest. So I did the concepts and every project just starts very simple and just goes crazy over time. So right. <laughs> the same thing happened with this as well. So I guess like... First one or two months went into concept design mostly. So Tim Miller is writing the concepts at like the small vignettes, and I was illustrating those vignettes for him, and just creating the uh, the language of the sequence overall. Uh, later on, there there was time to make the previous and the layout animation, and I did some camera movements and camera animation on that part. And later on, the team got bigger and bigger and bigger. So some modeling has been done, some scanning stuff has been done, and some fluid stuff has been done. And I worked on the fluid stuff also. And uh, I did some lighting. And I also do type animation and type placement over the sequence. So I can say pretty much I, I did some most of this stuff pretty much imaginable apart uh, yeah. Is that typical like that? I, I've never I haven't met many people who can do all of that. Is that typical at a place like Blur that you can have someone who's got the design and the conceptual chops to actually do concept art, but then also can jump in and start doing some fluid simulations? 
I don't think it is possible, but uh, I guess it is special for me, I guess, because uh, I like to get my hands dirty when I just enter a project. Uh, even on my personal directing work, I start with the pre-production, I do some storyboards myself, or if, if I don't have enough time, I just give that storyboard task to another person, or uh, if, I, if I have enough time, I do storyboarding myself, and also I do previews myself, and I do the editing myself, <laughs> if there's time if there's time also I can do the entire work myself as well so it's just a crazy thing I definitely want to come back to that when we get into directing because that, sure. that's a that was a big question I had uh, but, 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 but back to this particular project so um, whenever I've had designers that I work with who do, uh, you know, concept art, and I guess in my, I usually call them style frames because I'm working on commercials, yes. right? But it's basically concept art. Um, yeah. I've never, I mean, I'll usually have a conversation with them beforehand. Hey, so this is the client. This is what we're thinking. These are the goals. Uh, and the artist, the designer has a lot of leeway in what they design. So I'm curious, you mentioned that Tim was writing these yeah. these written treatments. So yeah. what would he have written that you then translated into these black, shiny, 3D people covered in this liquid with hands all over them? Like, what, what was, you know, like, how, what, at what point did that visual um, take off? Well, it just started from the scratch as like that. So first, uh, when projects first starting, I prepared like three frames for them. And it was like the, the perfect summarization of the entire thing I had in mind when thinking black over black and a very shiny surfaces just makes the details readable. Uh, then uh, I guess it's somewhere in between. Uh, always this, this conversation was happening with Mr. Fincher and Tim Miller. So they they just planned like a very uh, a lot of vignettes themselves. Uh, I can also read some of the vignettes. Uh, so I I have in uh, in my desk here. If you want, I can read them to you. I would I would love to hear that. I mean, because yeah. I'm always curious at what point the thing we see on screen becomes clear. Because there's always that that phase in the beginning where it's just words and it's an image in someone else's brain, and you have to somehow give life to it. Well, basically, the most of the vignettes just written from the book, and it's you know this is a like a trilogy. Yep. Like the first things we started with the Salander's motorcycle, so like the car, the uh, the first lady's motorcycle and the accessories, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And there's also some uh, story bits there. So when he when she attacks her father, stuff like that, and like his relationship with the Daniel Craig's character. Stuff like that. So just go went on, went on, went, and it just there was like a thirty or thirty-five small vignettes to be illustrated in total before going into layout stage. Right. So okay. So the concept, sort of the overall concept, was black on black, shiny surfaces, yeah. abstracting yeah, yeah. everything a bit, and then yeah. from there you layer on. Okay. Well, there's some story beats here. We're gonna see. Yeah, exactly. And 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 then it's up to you. So you know, what does the motorcycle look like? Does it look like a photorealistic motorcycle, or is it some yeah. super stylized thing? And th and that's kind of where you come in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. But uh, you know, we stick to the one rule in there. So it was just black on black and shiny surfaces. It uh, just makes the details readable. Uh, that was the plan. And we stick with that uh, idea and it just worked. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you this. So Blur, Blur is very interesting to me and I don't know a, a lot about them. Um, and when I think of them and when I look at their work, to me, they they, they stand out because they're, they create short films and they're, you know, Pixar level CG. I mean, it's like a film studio basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think of them the same way. I think of Buck and you know Royale and Oddfellows yeah. and and you know more more at motion designy studios. So I'm curious, how does design fit in over there? Because there must be a huge team of very technically minded 3D artists, and um, so I'm curious if design is as important at a place like Blur as it is at a place like Buck. No, I think so. It is important because uh, whenever you do something, uh, you are creating a story there. So the blur was no different, I think. Just uh, on that particular project, the girl with dragon tattoo titles, there was a design source was much more visible. That's why it happened. 
And right. Then, yeah. But uh, I think I think Blur is no different from from any other studio. But they do great work, and they are they are really crowded, and they do top top of the line work in in terms of CG and the cinematography. So it's just very photorealistic looking in terms of camera wise. Very cinematography is just perfect. Yeah, and that's one of the things that. So the the girl with the dragon tattoos title is one of my favorite things they've done because it's photorealistic. They're using their 3D chops to make it look like it was photographed, but it's not realistic. And I think that's, you know, it's a little bit different than most of the things I've seen from them. They're, you know, game trailers and cinematics and stuff, even though there might be wizards and magic spells and stuff. It looks like it was shot with actors, but this doesn't. Um, And and so I'm just curious, was that was that process at Blur? Was it a smooth process to kind of get the artists to make it look stylized, but photo real? Yeah, it, it just happens uh, when we are doing the, all these vignettes and illustrating them because we are doing a, like the a course correct thing ourselves to to the to the shots when we are doing the designs as well. So whenever I I was doing, for example, one vignette, another artist just coming and just preparing some draft three D models and creating camera moves around them, and we were always testing stuff if it translates well or not. And was, were you sort of leading the art direction of it and okaying shots, or was there a separate like VFX supervisor um, yeah, finally like shots over there? Multiple supervisors on at Blur. So yeah. uh, of course Tim Miller is leading the entire studio, and there was I guess one layout supervisor. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Frank Balson was the layout supervisor, and there's a CG supervisor uh, as well. So I, I just forget his name, sorry. But uh, yeah, I, I, at least like two or three different supervisors are just doing the multiple tasks. Uh, as you know, there's also an effect supervisor as well, so just some flame and just fra- fragmenting and stuff like that happens. And visual effects supervisor is just more focused on that part. But uh, there's like multiple branches in that uh, pipeline. Since it is very huge, I guess in total, like uh, maybe 100 people worked on the titles. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I, that, that's a side of the business I don't know a lot about. Yeah, that's, that's a big scale. Um, can you talk about, um, just because I know I'll probably get uh, you know emails about this if I don't ask you, but what's the software that was used to create all of this? I mean, a, a, you know, most of our students and our audience are familiar with After Effects and Cinema 4D. Those are the two yeah. things we use every day. But to get the simulations and all that kind of stuff, I know mm-hmm. you have to go to more sophisticated tools. What was used on the girl with the dragon tattoos? But, you know, when the studio got larger, that means uh, it becomes slower in a sense. So it's a very different discipline. So it's not like a C4D and After Effects scenario. Right. Uh, like there's multiple uh, branches and they're just very specialized in their own uh, things. So uh, people are using mostly the soft image at that time and uh, 2ds Max. So most of the stuff has been done in 2ds Max. Uh, the camera works and layout and shading and effects is done in 3ds Max. Fluid simulations are done in, in real flow, and some of them are just modeling. So just uh, they, we just faked some stuff. Like it is looking like fluid, but it's not fluid at all. Right, it's just brute force, like keyframing fluid, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you cannot really art direct some of the stuff when you want to fluid to do. Yeah, I've I've ha- I have a little bit of experience with real flow, and it uh, it's. It's interesting. I think this is something that listeners should should latch on to because uh, I used to teach at a at a college for a year and there was this tendency of students to get infatuated with really high tech software to think that it's going to help them creatively. And real flow was always on that list because it's just so cool what it does. Yeah. Um, but it's not like animation or design where you can be precise. Um, I'm sure the best real flow artists can be pretty precise, but there's always this randomness to it. You have no idea what's going to happen until you wait an hour, you know? It just uh, happens with the CG and physics. So you can never know what's going to happen in a physics software. So mm-hmm. you can just go crazy. If I mean, first thing, first thing I'm, that comes into my mind when you are doing C4D, like you can never guess how physics is going to 
uh, work in some certain objects because of the the nature of the object, let's say, the, the vertexes and stuff like that. So it can always go crazy or nuts easily. Exactly. So um, was there any, was any of the look of those titles done in the compositing phase or was it all no. pretty much captured in CG? We captured everything on CG because uh, Blur's method is just capture everything as much as they can on the uh, 3D software. Just leave um, like a very detailed work in the compositing. And their discipline is like more oriented in that fashion. Okay. Which was the experience overall. But uh, in my early career or just doing now, uh, I, I always fake stuff because, you know, there's not enough uh, render machines or just render boxes there. So we just come up with alternative solutions. But at Blur, these guys are like factory. They have like hundreds of machines. They do the rendering. <laughs> It's a different mentality. I mean, I'm I'm the I'm the, I'm the way you just described. I fake everything. Everything is how what's the quickest way I can do this? I stay 2D as long as possible and only go to 3D if I need. And then uh, I, there's more and more artists, especially now with you know GPU renderers, um, especially yeah. like that. It kind of makes it easier to just try yeah. and capture it. Um, are you are you keeping up with that stuff? I mean, are you getting into Always. Octane or you know? Um, I know V-Ray has got a, a you know in certain software platforms they can do it. Are you are you doing that now? No, I was all, I was always using the in GPU uh, when I started uh, on the Girl Dragon Tattoo title sequence. I was using the V-Ray RT at that time. So it was like 2011 and just just really really started to blossom all this GPU rendering stuff. So I, I also use Octane and Redshift. So pretty much I learned whatever is going to lead me the way and just create the, and just solve my problem. Right. And I'm guessing that those tools, uh, is it less about solving problems and more about just letting you play around, qu you know, more and, and iterate quicker? Yeah, I think solving problems is much more important. Excellent. All right, so let's let's move on from the girl with the dragon tattoo titles. Yeah. It's I, man, everyone. If you haven't seen that, you have to go look at it. It's so good, and the t the song they picked. I think Trent Reznor did this like cover of um, of a Led Zeppelin song. It's amazing. Yeah, it's so good. So after you after you worked on that, what was the effect on your career of having that on your resume? I assume it must have opened a lot of doors. Yeah, 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 it did. So when I was completing that project, the first directing job came to me. I, I was directing a commercial uh, for Magnum, the ice cream brand. I think it's a very high, like a high class looking ice cream brand. Brand, and I, uh, I was all morely, like more obsessed with their branding, and I was always fan of them. So let's say in terms of look and the like, the luxury style. Uh, stuff. So I did that after the Girl with Dragon Tattoo titles and my directing career just took off and I did many things after that. Okay, I'm glad you clarified that it was the um, the ice cream brand because there's also a condom brand <laughs> called Magnum. <laughs> yeah, yeah Not that one, not that Magnum. Uh, Alright, so how did that happen? Like, how, you know, you. it sounds like your role on the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo titles was similar to what a director does in some ways, but then a lot of, you know, there's always this catch 22. I feel like with, with careers where it's hard to get someone to pay you to do something unless you've already been paid to do it, you know? And so how did you get hired as a director on that? Well, it took some time and convincing. So uh, I have a, one manager working in Spain at that time, and he just get me this job to direct for Magnum. So okay, so you had essentially you had a you had a rep, someone representing you. Yes, and I I created like really nice style frames, and I always create like the draft editing, and like some storyboards and you know just the oh, okay. the did you that, did you have to pitch? You pitched to to win that gig? Yes, I guess I against I pitch against like six different companies. Ah. And I just, Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so this is where my, my knowledge totally breaks down because th this side of the industry is totally foreign to me. So how does this work? Does does the brand hire you? Does their ad agency hire you? Does the ad agency hire a production company which then hires you? How does this all fit together? 
You know, it's a very interesting to answer because all of them happen. So <laughs> <laughs> all possible scenarios are possible because yep. in my career, uh, sometimes just a brand comes in or sometimes there's just agency comes in and with the agency or with the client, we pick the production company that who will be responsible of the production and the post-production. And sometimes just the production company comes in and just brings my name to the agency and client. And sometimes my manager just brings me to the production company or the client. So it's, it's all, all the scenarios are possible. So w- why don't production companies or even post-production companies just hire full-time directors to, you know, to direct the work that comes in. Why have this model where you have a bunch of 3D artists and a VFX supervisor, but then you have to hire, you know, kind of a freelance director for jobs? Mm-hmm. I think each project is different and there's not much of a continuity of the, that project or that particular discipline. That's why it is not happening. Because when you're telling someone to come in-house and do the same thing for a year, it's a very different scenario than come there, like do, do it for three months or two months and just be done with it. That's why. Okay, so it's more about having a, a variety of people you can call on. You know, Owner Centric might be the perfect director for this ice cream brand, but then we've also, we, we have a, I don't know, like a, a, a brand for kids and it needs to be fun and playful and we don't see that on his reel so we need somebody else for that is that the idea yeah, exactly exactly because uh, advertising and the production companies just morally focus on the the proven success so they just uh, define a successful event in someone else's career and just take that person to that uh, client and just introduce them and that's how the, it functions as a system, which I don't agree to, right. but it just happens as it is. Yeah, it makes, it does make sense. Um, yes. and, and I guess that, that kind of answers the question about why do, you know, why do directors need reps? Well, it's because there's a hundred production companies and, and you're marketing to all of them. But let me ask you this, uh, is there, is there ever a situation where you sort of flip that model on its head and you hire the production company yeah. to execute the idea that you've been hired for. Yes. Yes, that, that happened. Uh, on my second commercial for Magnum, that happened because the production company in the U.S. didn't solve it. The production company in Europe couldn't solve the problem. And at, at the last case scenario, the client came in and just sent me an email, that huge brand. So we just picked one production company somewhere in Turkey and just we just solved this problem of theirs in like two weeks. Interesting. So when you're working on a project, let's say that you get hired to work with, um, I know you've worked with Post Panic before. Yes. Uh, and they're in uh, Amsterdam, correct? Yeah. Okay. So do you go and you live in Amsterdam the length of that project? Uh, for that project, yes. But uh, that particular project first started in Istanbul. So, and uh, I did the like storyboards and the layout process happened in Istanbul, Turkey. Then later on, like after a month later, I, I went to Amsterdam for the shoot and the post-production process. So it took like a, almost two months more to complete it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you, you do the part remotely that you can do remotely but then when you're yeah. when you have 10 3d artists working on this on the shots you want to be there in person yeah yeah whatever is just healthy for the production to be honest because the, the most important thing is to result so if if i can serve the result better i travel so it's not a yeah. Do you, I, I'm interested in this because I have a family, I have three small children. And hey. so the idea of, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's a different podcast, my friend. Yes, uh, yes. So the, the thought of I, as fun and as great as it would be for me to go to Amsterdam for two months, if I, let's say I, if I was a director, is it harder 
I mean, obviously it is harder to do that if, if you have a family, does that, I don't know, do you have a family and does that influence your thinking about it at all? Cause it seems like it would almost be a big obstacle to doing things this way. No, you don't, you shouldn't think it as an obstacle because in that case, um, your family can come with you in the Amsterdam. It's not a problem because uh, in post panic with, with those guys, they are just really family oriented people. So that's com- that was completely fine, and they booked me a really huge house, and I stayed there alone. I, I totally wish that there will be a wife and some children to to be with me, but <laughs> that was not the case. Uh, right, that that'll be your next project. Um, okay, well, you know what? I mean, it's funny that I think that shows my. Uh, my sort of American mentality that it's like, it would be weird to bring your family with you for work, but actually it makes perfect sense. Um, well, not, and I, not like we're bringing the family to work, but they just be in Amsterdam and they will be, you know, at your side and you just, you, you do your job and you can go, come back to from job and just, uh, you know, spend some time with them. Right, and they can wander around, and they can they can eat some yeah, yeah. Uh, some pulfridges, and uh, absolutely. Yeah, but, uh, you know, when I was working with Postbank, to be honest, they are really organized and planned people. When we were doing that project, there was no overtime issues, and there was no late nights. So it's like the perfect scenario to bring the fa- family on that project. I'm gonna have to interview them and ask them how they pull that off because yeah, that's that's, uh, <laughs> that's very hard. <laughs> I totally that's respect too- them. So. Like, a, a, you know, their scheduled day starts at 10 and they just leave at 6 or 7 that they are completely fine. And there is no overtime, so it was really perfect place. Uh, you know, I, I visited many studios and I worked with mo- multiple places. But the, the very first time I seen such discipline and commitment. That's amazing. So the the job that you're talking about, I believe, is the Amnesty International one, and I want to get to that one in a little bit. But I want to I want to learn a little bit more about what directing means, uh, because it, you know I, I've talked to a lot of motion designers, and you say, "Hey, what's your goal in ten years?" Oh, I kind of want to get into directing, and mm-hmm. I honestly don't know what that means. So <laughs> what? Um, yeah. let's start, let's start with this. So what are some things about directing that you think people don't know? Like, what are some things that surprised you when you started directing? I think from outside, when you are looking from the outside, it looks like a, the perfect place, an ideal place to be in. But when you're inside, it is just totally different because you are responsible from everything. Either it is good decisions or bad decisions. It's your decisions, and you are responsible from everything. So it's a very, very difficult task. And it's more pressure. Yes, like a, a lot of pressure. You, you, you have to speak with the client and you have to speak with the visual effects people and you have to do the animations. If you are doing the animations, if you, you are doing the editing as well. So after talking all these with the different people, you still have to do your own thing. <laughs> Directing is like that. And it just starts from pre-production. It just extends, to pro- extends into production phase. And there's like a live action shoot happens and stuff like that. And it just more extends into post-production process and until the delivery of the project. So it's like the completely same. So I don't think myself as a, a leading man, but just as a team member still, because you are still delivering a job. That's interesting. That's an interesting way to look at it. Um, so uh, you kind of have a dual role and and you might be unique because you're still in there getting your hands dirty and you're, you're animating shots. And I'm, I'm guessing some directors don't do that. They, they let their team handle all of that. But was there any challenge transitioning from being a member of a team with, you know, uh, a leader, a supervisor over you and it's kind of their ass on the line if it goes wrong uh, to being the leader and to having all of that you know, on you, it, it, what was the biggest challenge about becoming, even though you said you don't think of yourself as a leader, you are the leader of the job. So what, what were the challenges there? Yeah, you, you think, yeah, you look like a leader, but uh, in reality, as I said, you are serving for a cause. So you want to complete that film in, at the end of the day. So you are serving for job to be completed. So you're still a team member, right? maybe, maybe a high class team member, but still a team member. <laughs> But that doesn't matter. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, when I t- think about the, and oversee the complete process, uh, for example, director of photography just comes in 
just in, in a certain stage of the process. So he comes in like the after pre production is done, and like first you're planning the live action shoot, and he shoots your film or whatever you shoot with with him, and he just takes off after a few days. But uh, as a director of the project, you you stick with that project in the post production phase and editing phase and every phase possible. So, did you yeah. did you find it was difficult at all to you know as a, as a director um, as any type of supervisor on a project like this you have to sometimes tell people that what they did isn't working and yeah, yeah you know and it, it's not good enough and you know you're gonna pro you may have to stay a little late to fix it or something like that it, was that difficult for you at all have you learned any tricks to to make that part easier. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can see that coming. If a problem is start, uh, like a blossoming, you are just you will see that uh, coming from a mile away. But uh, uh, this kind of uh, sensibility just grows over time. In my first early career, uh, like career days, and I, I couldn't see that coming. But uh, later, right. by each year, I can see that coming easily, and I I just take my like Plan Bs and Plan Cs uh, under my you know arms and go with if something bad happens and there's also also there's like producers are helping you on that task as well so you are not alone in that because when you're directing something you are just uh, more focused on conveying the message to the audience you are responsible uh, like some practicalities in that process belong to the producer for example if that particular problem is uh, in the live action area it's up to line line producer to deal with that. If it's more on the post production side, the, the post producer has to deal with that as well. On and they will help you on this. So it's really about paying attention uh, and having you know the producers that are managing the artists pay attention as well, so that yeah. you're catching you're catching potential issues before they become you yeah. know showstoppers. Yeah, because uh, you know as an artist, you just first. Uh, more focused on the material you are getting, but uh, you you are not really focused on the practicality of some things uh, during the process. The, that practicality is producer's task to solve and you know help you on that because their speciality is there, and I totally respect it because uh, without the producers, some problems can go to very huge levels and you can experience very nightmarish scenarios. Oh, I've I've been there. I uh, I think producers are the unsung heroes <laughs> of the industry. Yeah. I think they deserve the deserve a huge credit as well because yeah. when we are think of filmmaking, it's a really collaborative process. You can do that alone, but you are crazy enough to do that alone. But when you are doing it somebody else, you know, you have to be a team and you have to be on the same side and fighting for the same cause. Exactly. So you mentioned that, you know, even things that you're directing where you have a team working with you, you still like to, you know, get your hands dirty with design and doing shots and animating and even simulating stuff. Yes. Um, it is. Why is that? Because, uh, you know, I, I've heard interviews with other directors who mm -hmm. start that way, but then in the end, they transition off of that and they like to, you know, find people more talented than themselves to do things. Um, do you, I'm curious, like, why do you still like to be in the trenches like that? I want to make this uh, a personalized experience. It's not like uh, somebody else comes in and fix things for you. If there's a way that I want to touch the more aspects as much as I can. For example, if I, if I can do the editing on my piece alone, uh, I do that because it really just hurts me to tell an editor just cut this three frames early or cut this like a one second early stuff like that because I can do that so I don't want to hurt people <laughs> and just tell them you know because I'm I'm on my head already and I know what I what I wanted to do and what I want to achieve in that particular project so telling me telling somebody else is just making more complicated for me to be honest. That makes sense. And I can totally relate to that too. Um, it, it almost sounds like there's a term for that, which is um, superhero syndrome, where you're like, oh, I'll just do it. <laughs> it's faster yeah. if I just do it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's get into a little nitty gritty here. So, you know, a, a, when I was 
so I, my career, I've been full time, I've been freelance, and I've been a creative director at a studio that I that I had a stake in. Um, but and and the way that you earn income in those situations is fairly cut and dry. But how mm-hmm. does a director figure out how much? to charge and, and how does that work? So uh, I'm curious if you could just kind of give us an overview of how directors yeah. bill for their services. If you are more focused on the live action directing, you charge per day. But it's more, if it's more leaning on the visual effects side or post-production side, I usually get the percentage out of the job. Let's say 10% of the total budget. Stuff like that. But uh, when I'm when I uh, just came across a project which I feel much more personal uh, link be- uh, and I felt that link between and I I can take the initiative that I want to do. So I can say that I, I will take less money and I let's spend this with more on the production side and let's do a greater job, stuff like that. So Yeah, that's the same thing that happens, you know, in motion design studios where there are jobs that they're not very excited to do, but they have a big budget and they'll keep the lights on. And then there's jobs that they're going to lose money on, but they'll yeah. do it because it's going to help their portfolio. And it, I mean, it works the same way in directing. It sounds like. Yes. Totally same. Yeah. So looking at your portfolio, um, you know, if you go to your site, all the work on there is really, really cool. <laughs> really, really good. Is there stuff that you're directing that you don't put on there that pays the yeah. bills and, and stuff like that? Yeah, there are a couple of stuff, but it's a very rare occasions that happens because, you know, nobody starts with a project that will be the the worst things that we are going to do, but somewhere along the way, it just becomes a, like a catastrophe. You know, when you complete the project, some people will be happy with that, with that, but as a director, you are not happy at the end. These projects happen, so. Do you ever turn projects down? Yeah, of course, every time. Yeah. Because what would, what would be a reason that you turn it down? Whenever it's not looking healthy or it's not looking good enough, you turn you turn that project down because uh, the the other side is the, the worst becomes much much worse because you hurt your career and you hurt your reputation at the end and you hurt your cre- credibility as well. So it's just m- higher stakes. Yeah. And how many projects can you direct in a year? No, there's like multiple things I can do. I guess like uh, I can direct like 12 projects in a year for sure. But, 12 uh, projects a year. I mean, that's, that's a good amount, but, but I guess you would need to be picky because if two of yeah. those end up being stinkers, <laughs> then yeah. that's a big percentage. Yeah. Yes, still a big percentage, but I, I, I prefer to do less because uh, I wanted to grow as an intellectual myself because I do lots of reading and watching stuff, stuff like that. Because it, by each thing that I want to do, I wanted to do a big step up, even though I'm doing animation sometimes or composing or whatever, but I wanted to step up intellectually. So I, I, I'll be very picky about the projects I accept. Yeah, that's great because you need your name. I mean, your name is your brand and you need it yeah. to be associated with quality. Yeah. So how do you how do you get your name out there as a director? You know, like how do you, especially when you're starting, how do you get people to take you seriously? Well, it just, it just takes a lot of time and effort, of course. Uh, but uh, it's good to have a, your personal voice out there because other than that, it will be impossible to, to be known or just people recognize your name. And you said it has to be your personal voice and you kind of got noticed through personal projects. So is that, yeah. is that really like the secret, like not the secret, but that's, that's a good way in is through personal projects. It's an obvious secret. We can say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, unspoken, but obvious. I mean. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's not like a, an obvious career path to become a director without yeah, putting in a bunch that. of your time, you know, you, you have to do, you have to direct something and show people that it turns out good, yeah. even though yeah. you did it for free. Yeah. Yeah. You have to step out of your comfort zone because directing is just taking the charge you, know, you have to take the charge and just accept whatever comes with it. Either it is misery or it's just a, a big fame. You have to accept that. So there's no middle ground on that. Yeah. Misery or fame and nothing in between. I love it. (laughs) That's great owner. Um, 
All right. So let me ask you this question. Um, you know, I, I've for a, a short time, I did work kind of in the production realm and I worked around some pretty successful commercial directors, live, live action, not visual effects. Yeah. Um, and some of them, you know, could charge a $30,000 fee just to show up on a commercial plus whatever they charged per day. Yeah. Uh, and these guys would make a pretty good living. I'm curious how yeah. much money can a successful. And, and so when I say director, I, I'm talking about a director like you, like a visual effects, motion designy mm -hmm. kind of director, like a Patrick Clare, you know, or, or David Lewandowski, someone like that. How much can you earn doing this? Well, it's not like you said, but uh, I, as I said, I get the percentage yep. out of a uh, uh, project whenever something comes up. But, uh, you know, the, the, the amount you mentioned is more like a relying on the live action side. And it just comes, I guess they are doing it for over the years. And they are just doing it this like 40 years, I guess, the same thing. Yeah. Just it comes in, they just get a daily rate and just be be done with that but uh, in just post-production and cg heavy works it's it's never like that and uh, as a person and what are the what are the budget oh sorry go ahead yeah yeah uh, as a director i just i just do the and i i take the initiative sometimes so let's say there's a hundred thousand euros budget of a particular project uh you get just the 10,000 10, euros of it and you just spend the 90,000 to the production of it. Or if you want much more good result, you get just get 5,000 and just spend everything on the production. Right. And, and that's interesting because it gives you, it gives you that option. If you think this is something yeah. that it's worth putting a couple of months into because you'll get a lot of work afterwards, you yeah, can take a smaller right. fee. But you know, it's, get, it's just important to get your name out there. Uh, it's not just important to get the money at the end of the day. There's the mo not the most important thing because oh, of course, your, yeah. Your reputation is much more important because uh, in future that will just bring the jobs to you. Not that making the day or just living the day will not do uh, just save you at the end. I, I've heard from a lot of studio owners over the past couple of years that. Um, budgets for these kinds of projects just keep going down. What's yeah. what's the range of budgets that you're seeing out there for the the kind of work that you do? Well, it just varies from uh, from project to project. But uh, as I said, as you said, it's just going down and down because I guess uh, post production and visual effects are a really hard thing to do. So the ad advertising agencies just stay away from it, and they want to keep it much more simple and just straightforward. Do you think that there is so the you know the visual effects industry that that services feature films yeah. uh, is going through an interesting phase? They have been for the past few years, where a lot of the work yeah. is being outsourced to yeah. countries where labor is much much cheaper. You know, India and, and places like that. Yeah. Um, do you see any of that in the commercial visual effects realm? Is that happening in your world? Yeah. Uh, I think the visual effects for feature films just making a big transition now. I guess this transition has been happening for at least five years. Uh, it's very visible. So the last time when I was in Los Angeles, it was like a visual effects cemetery. So like a rhythm when he was uh, bankrupt during that year and like most of the artists were laid off and uh, looking for a place to work in the motion industry or the commercials but uh, you know the same thing happening in the commercials as well so commercials getting smaller and they're just making much more leaning on the live action side just create like a much more simpler thing to handle yeah yeah and trickier to outsource because if you want to shoot a commercial yeah. in amsterdam you hire yeah. you know a dutch production company you don't hire a cheap production company from you know wherever you know India or yeah. something and fly them over. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So do you, yeah. do you think that, that at some point you might be a director on a spot, but you're directing artists who are, you know, somewhere where you can hire a good CG artist for $15 an hour? No, no. That's good. <laughs> because, because I, I like to get a good artist uh, with a, like a less days to work with than a cheap artist, like more days to work on. <laughs> Because, you know, 
getting the artist to uh, the perfect level is a, is a very difficult task because it just uh, takes an understanding and a philosophy. So if that artist doesn't have that range in their career or their mind as a person, they can never reach that level. And you can never, if you, even if you try your best, you cannot get that out of them. And that yeah, you know, there's that... There's that saying, you get what you pay for. Um, and I think it's yeah. it's especially true with talent um, at super high levels yeah. like that. If you want your work to be top quality, you, you're going to pay top dollar, you know? Yeah, yeah. You have to pay it. Yep. So let's talk about a couple of your, a couple of your projects. There's a project that we're definitely going to link to and I recommend everybody check it out because it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's a great message and a great piece and also just technically in just incredible execution i'm talking about the uh, amnesty international piece and for everyone listening if you haven't seen it yet it's it's essentially there's this toy that has like all of these pins and you can stick your hand under it and see your hands stick up like you know sort of like a, a topographical map built by these pins and it's this entire story that's told yeah. in that in that way and i'm wondering uh, can you just describe how did that project come about? How did you get involved? Well, during that time, uh, like there, there was like some political events happening in Turkey, and I was really sensible about that subject because uh, whenever someone's making a protest, some aggressive suspension system just comes in, just uh, just uh, proves the violence will be a solution to that kind right. of event as a result. Uh, so. That project came in the perfect timing in 2013, like after I finished directing Guinness commercial. So it came from a troublemakers, a French production company, which is representing me in Paris. And we designed this thing with the TBWA Paris together. The, the, the entire production time took like five months to complete. Uh, I guess like the first one month or first one and a half month we went into animatic and the design phase and the technical tests uh, as far as I remember there's just uh, one inspirational piece I remember uh, and again from David Fincher you know there's a Nine Inch Nails video I guess I don't remember that song I guess it's called Only okay. it uses the same technique but it just uses on an expressive level so it's not like telling a story but uh, Again, the same toy, using a figure, and yeah, we are just seeing that thing doing the music video. And I remember just the, that is the only reference I had in mind for this one. And I, I think, how can we top that? And how can we just use this to tell a story? So we, we just team with a, a, another visual effects company in Paris. So it's called One More Productions. Mm -hmm. and these guys did the Pixels short film. I guess also uh, work on Pixel's feature film, but I'm not sure. Uh, the short they, film was much better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They did yeah. the short film. I remember that, but I'm not sure about the yeah, feature I remember film. that was great. Yeah, yeah. So I worked with these guys, and we just came up with the, the technique and just the methods to how to make it the best looking possible work. So where did the idea to... So was it your idea to, to have yeah. this be rendered using the pins? No, uh, the idea came from agency, but uh, whenever agencies comes with that kind of ideas, they came, came up with uh, like alternative questions with them. They say, can we do that? And it's just my job to answer them that we can do it or not, we cannot do it. So, and I wanted to do, then challenge the technique to tell a story using this method. So originally the idea you... came from agency. Did you work on any of the concept art that kind of proved that you could use this technique and it would work? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, I'm imagining this had to be a fairly technical execution. Yes. Um, yes. So how did you, how did you approach even figuring out just how you would do it? Not even what it would look like, but just how it would actually get done. Well, we, we were thinking with a one more together on this, how we can do it. There was like two solutions came up. Just the, the first solution was doing a live action shoot and like using 2D uh, masking and rotoing techniques to create this 3D illusion. And it will be like mm -hmm. much more expensive work. 
And the, the other solution was doing a mocap shoot and get the, get them 3D, get them out of 3D with their special rendering passes. And again, putting them into a 3D software and apply the same effect. So we went with the second route on this one. So and you built 3D scenes, and I'm assuming you rendered like a depth map, and then you used that yeah. to drive the height of the yeah. pins? But early on, I worked with three actors and get the performance out of them. And we did the entire blocking of the commercial once uh, in Maya. This time I used Maya, so because the studio was using Maya. And I did the blocking and we did uh, all this cinematography and the perfect editing. Then we rendered out each se sequence, uh, each shot. Then put them again through the Max and create the effect out. And again, render it out. It's like a double toasted. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's a lot of rendering. So let me ask you this. The, in that piece in particular, the performance of the motion capture actors and, and even the facial performances, I'm assuming those yeah. were just animated traditionally with keyframes or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, you know, that that's you were directing essentially actors there. Um, and I've seen, there is some more of that in your work, but, but not, not a lot. This, that piece is the one that I've seen that has the most human emotion in it. Um, and I'm curious if there was a learning curve for that, because that's not a, a technical skill that you can just practice on your computer at home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a learning curve happening there. And I, I just do it more and more. What are some of the lessons you've learned about getting good performances out of out of humans and not just out of computers? Uh, you just try like multiple things, but each project is different and each actor is different, I guess. Um, because uh, in, at that project, I work with French people and French, French actors, so they were not speaking very good English. And my producer and my first AD did a good job on that. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you had to translate. Yeah, okay. Also, likewise, when I, whenever I go to another country, let's say Amsterdam or China or whatever, uh, there's just a, another team of local people just uh, supporting the production as well. So mm -hmm. it's just never le left out of the chance to... Uh, or just... Uh, in the, the, the last project I directed, I, there's a, like a child actor, uh, but uh, the... The actor I picked couldn't perform very well, so I had another actor in, a, in backup. So <laughs> I bring that actor and just use that. Right. The result. There's just more backup plans. But the, on that particular project, like all these three actors are really physical actors, and their body language is really very, very, very well done, you know. And they can go into like much more uncomfortable situations. The the one guy uh, who who played the lead guy, Roman Ogeru, uh, he he's doing like a more motion capture work for the game, so he was more comfortable. And I used as as a main actor on this one. So sometimes he just become the guy who is being tortured and the, the protester. Right. Also, at one point, I I made him to to be the police officer as well. So uh, it just becomes a very different, different thing. So he just tortures himself at some point. <laughs> that's, that's the dream gig, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. So it sounds like, so casting is important, but then also having a backup plan <laughs> if it doesn't go well. Yeah, the, the live action productions is always just scheduled for that date. And you have to be prepared whatever comes. That's all I can say. I mean, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a little, you're working without a net a little more than you are in post. Yeah, yeah. But uh, again, we are in a computer age. I cannot imagine myself like 20 years ago or like 30 years ago. And, you know, I, I do previous all the time. And I just define the, the shot early on. And I just pick the lenses early on. So to test everything without going to the set. It's just a big luxury. Right. And then there's less, there's less guesswork on the day. Yeah, so yeah. that, that amnesty piece won you a whole bunch of awards. I'm sure yeah. that that helped, you know, your career even more. Um, but recently you released a personal project called Genesis. Yeah. 
yeah. um, which is it's gorgeous. I highly recommend everyone see it, and it's going to sell a mm-hmm. lot of uh, it's going to sell a lot of 3D software, I think. Um, but and, and it I'm, it sounds like you did that by yourself, and and yeah. I can't imagine how long that took. So, can you talk about why, why at this point in your career, where you, the work you're doing is beautiful mm-hmm. and technical and cool and and has great messages why do you still do personal work and that piece in particular because uh no matter what i'll do in terms of commercials they will never bring me or ad agencies or production companies will never bring me the jobs i'm imagining in the future so uh, so in that case i take the initiative and do the work myself that's why so Right. So it's to scratch your own itch, basically. So this piece in particular is very technical. Again, lots of particles and shallow depth of field and stuff like that. It's really cool. Uh, how yeah. long did this take to make? I, I guess it took a couple of months, but uh, I was uh, I didn't have much job to do in the, during that time. And I was you know, doing lots of reading and just watching some documentaries and I'm just doing one shot a day, something like that. And when you do a personal project, do you follow the same process that you would for a client where you board things out, you do previs, you rough edit? I mean, how do, how do, you, how do you manage personal projects versus commercial? It's just kind of similar. You know, there's a, there's a big reason that people do these previs and just the, doing the draft editings. And uh, I still do that for my own pieces as well but uh, you know uh, I wanted to experiment something new and since I'm not telling what I'm going to do a big crew or people um, I can do whatever I want on that so it just becomes more personal and it can become much more dirty but uh, since it's very technical that I have to follow a certain guides not to become a very chaotic mess at the end in terms of project files and everything so I, I have a project structure that I follow. That makes sense because uh, I, I can imagine with simulations and render passes and final renders and version one, version two. Um, yeah. So so that piece took you two months. And um, what was the what was the thought behind it? Uh, you, you mentioned, um, you know, at the very beginning of this interview that you used to be obsessed with 80s horror title sequences yeah. and um genesis i think maybe it's the music or something it kind of has that feel to it um mm. what was what was kind of the I, I guess the drive behind making that piece well during that time i was watching lots of star trek and i was watching alien and aliens and yep. all alien franchises and I was also like watched, I guess, like a couple of times the 2001 Space Odyssey. So I was very obsessed with the existentialist uh, science fiction stuff. Right. And just wanted to do like a one minute piece and do something like this. That's fantastic. And then when you do a personal project like this, do you heavily promote it so that it will, you know, other people might see it and then more opportunities open up? Or do you just do it for you? Yeah, I just do it for myself. But if it's good enough, it always gets the attention. Because whenever you are making the film, that's the important. You you just make it for yourself in the first place. If it is cool enough, if it if it gets more, it will get gain and gain more attention. It becomes important for somebody else as well. Uh, that's that's really good advice. All right, so I have two more questions for you, owner. So the yeah. first one is. If anyone listening, you know, hearing you talk about your experiences as a director in this kind of visual effects motion design realm, if if they want to become a director one day, what advice would you give someone who's at the beginning of their career? Oh, I think they have to take the initiative and they they have to take the charge for themselves, not for the commercial project, but uh, like the self-initiated projects as a start. I think this is the most important thing to begin with. Yeah, you, ha- you have to do the work before someone's willing to pay you for yeah, it. Advertising, as I said, it just always relies on the like proven success. So you have to prove you're, you are successful, then they will come for you. I agree. I agree totally. And my last question, owner, 
bringing it way back to the beginning to the eighties horror movies. I'm curious cause uh, I, I was a child of the eighties also, and I loved eighties horror movies, nightmare on Elm street and yeah, you know, all that stuff. I, so I'm curious what, what your favorite eighties horror film is. And then I'll tell you what mine is. Well, my favorite eighties uh, horror film is the thing. The thing. Oh yeah. The classic, the thing. Yeah, Good choice. The thing. I would say mine is, uh, it's an obscure one. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. It's called Monster Squad. No, I didn't watch it this one. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to go check that one it. out. Some re- really right. good 80s music in it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Owner, thank you thank you so much for doing this interview, man. I learned a ton. I know everyone listening learned a ton. And this was, this was so much fun, man. Thank you very much, Joey, for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here on the show incredible dude right make sure you check out owner's work it's amazing and we're going to link to it in the show notes i want to say thanks again to owner for coming on and for being so open about his experiences as a director and for sharing so much of the behind the scenes stuff that we never really get to hear about i also want to thank you as always for listening to the school of motion podcast and if you dig this you should also go to our site and sign up for a free student account so you can gain access to hundreds of project file downloads exclusive discounts and our famous Motion Mondays newsletter. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next one.